Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So today we are going to continue understanding occupational health and uh, specifically we are going to delve into accidents in workplaces and uh, we are going to focus mainly on uh, the healthcare workplace or the healthcare setting and we are going to understand the different types of accidents that can take place and classify them based on severity, frequency and prevent preventability. <clears throat> we are going to look at uh, the individual organization and environmental risk factors that can be associated with these accidents and uh, also see a way of mitigating them. Then we are also going to look at the, prevent, the, the ways of preventing accidents in the healthcare settings, like I said earlier, and also how to report and investigate these uh, accidents and near misses. So <clears throat> before we even start, I want us to recognize that uh, accidents, of course, are always unfortunate events. They are unplanned, they are undesirable, and you and I could have experienced such accidents either in healthcare settings or healthcare workplaces or other workplaces you might have had, you might have experienced, or you might have read about such accidents. They are always undesirable, they are always unfortunate, they are always unplanned. But as we go on in pursuit of uh, this module, we shall discover that uh, some of these accidents can actually be preventable and as public health professionals we need to learn and uh, how to investigate some of these uh, the causes of these accidents so that we can put in place proactive measures to prevent the occurrence of some of these accidents. So uh, you can realize that uh, reporting and learning from these incidents of accidents should be very should be very critical in our practice so that <clears throat> we improve the patient safety and enhance quality assurance in the healthcare system because we do not want people to lose trust in the healthcare that we are providing. People should not come when they are anxious about being involved in an accident in that health facility. They should come when they are very confident in our healthcare facility and uh, they are confident about the quality of the healthcare that they are going to receive so that they earn the best from it. So the types of accidents, like we said, uh, can be classified <coughs> in terms of severity, in terms of frequency, in terms of preventability. And uh, when you look at severity, then you can have minor accidents, you can have Moderate accidents, you can also have severe accidents, and minor accidents can be as simple as a slip and fall. For example, if there is a wet flow in the healthcare facility and someone slips and they fall, then uh, and, and they do not have a significant injury, they might have soft tissue injuries like a strain and a sprain, then that can be classified as a minor injury and it falls under the category of severity but medication errors that can result into patient harm if a, med a given medicine is supposed to be administered via the muscle or what we call intramuscular injection and this injection is now uh, mistakenly given IV or intravenous through the vein then it could result into this patient harm. Or if a particular patient is supposed to receive a certain drug and they receive a different one because of these, uh, of, of, uh, of, of these mistakes that can be made and it results into their harm, then that will be a severe accident that we are looking at here. So they can be minor, they can be moderate, they can also be severe. When we categorize them according to severity, then when we look at frequency, there are those accidents that are so common, there are those that are not so common, and uh, those that are not so common can also be termed as rare. So the common accidents can be those needle stick accidents uh, which occur 
whenever you you using those uh, needles and maybe it pierces you or you have used it on a patient and then uh, before recapping or before throwing it into where it should be disposed of then you mistakenly pierce yourself and sometimes those ones can lead to infections you know so we 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 have also we have had people getting infected of uh, diseases from patients due to these needle stick injuries. So those ones are a bit common, but uh, patient development incidents or the act of patients discharging themselves or escaping from the hospital without uh, no, notifying anyone that is responsible, then. then those ones are a bit rare and they are called patient development incidents. So according to frequency, we can have common accidents like those needle stick injuries. Then we can also have rare accidents like patient development incidents. Uh, in terms of pre preventability, we have preventable accidents which can involve those miscommunications uh, uh, leading to wrong site surgeries. So if healthcare professionals do not communicate in a proper way or they they miscommunicate with each other, then you can end up with uh, those wrong site surgeries. Someone could mistakenly tell the, surger, the, the surgeon that it is uh, maybe the pancreas that has the problem, uh, yet in actual sense, it is uh, the kidney. So if you go for the pancreas, which is which is healthy, and you leave out the kidney, then that will be the wrong side surgery. So these miscommunications can always be preventable, and we shall see how to prevent them as we go on with this discussion. Then the unpreventable accidents can include those equipment malfunctions that are unforeseen, so those might not be easily preventable. So factors that can contribute to accidents are also classified into individual factors, organizational factors, and environmental factors. So when we look at uh, individual factors, we have things like fatigue and lack of sleep, inadequate training by the healthcare professional and experience and then distractions and multitasking. So if you lack sleep, ultimately your brain will not function as that person who has enough sleep. Okay? And when we, we talk about training, sometimes uh, people might lack the necessary training to conduct some of these procedures and they will end up uh, getting this these are uh, getting into these scenarios of accidents, okay? Then experience also comes in handy here because you might have the necessary training, but you need more hands-on uh, practice and to gain this experience and uh, confidence to conduct some of these procedures in the healthcare setting. So when you like this, you can also be... Uh, at risk of uh, of being involved in an accident, then distractions and multitasking, especially now that we are in the in this social media era, people want to use their phones even when they are working on patients, and that this can always lead to these accidents that are that we are talking about here. Then, when we look at organizational factors, we we want to examine those. Uh, those factors that are, that exist in that healthcare organization or the healthcare system that could lead to these accidents. Things like inadequate staffing levels, which can lead to that work overload on those people who are there and end up making these mistakes which lead to those accidents. Poor communication and teamwork. If you're not working uh, in a team fashion, then you're, you will end up are getting those scenarios of accidents more often. Poor communication, again, like we said, 
it can lead to those uh, 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 th- th- those those incidents of uh, wrong side uh, uh, wrong side surgeries because you have not communicated well between each other, you know, then lack of clear policies and procedures, which uh, which should be in place to regulate some of uh, the behaviors of these healthcare workers and like we can all acknowledge these uh, behaviors sometimes are the ones that contribute to these uh, accidents occurring so if there are these clear policies and procedures then we are able to regulate some of these behaviors and and uh, we are going to lessen the chance of having accidents for example if it is clearly stipulated in uh, in the policies and 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 <clears throat> and regulations that you shouldn't drink and come to work do not drink alcohol and come to work but uh, then you will have prevented accidents that could result from a pers- a drunkard uh, a drunkard coming to work in that healthcare uh, setting you know but if you do not have such clear policies to regulate such things like drinking, then you will have drunkards working on patients. And if a drunkard or a drunken uh, doctor is working on a patient, there is always higher chance of accident. Then environmental factors, we look at things like inadequate lighting or slippery floors, which can lead to those uh, falls. Then we have faulty medical equipment, disorganized workplaces, all these contribute to accidents occurring. So accident causation or the occurrence of these accidents has been theorized by many scholars. And as we can see, there are theories that, uh, that, 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 that make us understand how some of these accidents in all workplaces occur okay but since we are focusing on on the healthcare workplace then we are going to to really tailor our understanding of these causation theories to that uh, workplace the healthcare workplace or the hospital or the clinic or any other health uh, healthcare facility that you can think of so we have theories like the Hendrix <coughs> domino theory. We have the multiple causation theory, the biased liability theory, the energy transfer theory, and symptom versus causes theory. So there are five, and uh, we are going to look at three or four, and then the others can be for your personal reading. So when you look at the Hendrix domino theory, he he looked at accidents as one of the factors in a sequence leading to an injury. That if an injury is on the last part of these dominoes, then the accident is only just one factor in that sequence that leads to this injury. So you look at all these other factors, and in this theory by Herbert William Henry, we are saying that these factors are connected and each of them is dependent on that factor that precedes it, okay? So if you're looking at this illustration, you can see that the accident, which is in that black domino, uh, the second last as you go to the right, is preceded by the unsafe act. And the unsafe act is also preceded by the fault of a person and this fault of a person can arise from the social environment, okay? So this accident is not just a standalone event, okay? For the accident to lead to the injury, it has to result from the unsafe act. The unsafe act is also resulting from the fault of a person, and the fault of a person is coming from the social environment. You can look at, uh, you can uh, exemplify this from, uh, the example that I, I I I just gave of drinking and going to work. So drinking and going to work will be that 
fault of a person, you know. But this fault of a person could be influenced by the social environment, you know, if you are in a, if you are living in an environment of drink of people who drink, you are living in a you have friends who drink and you are a medic or a doctor, you will also most likely end up drinking because you're influenced by that social environment. So if you drink and go to work, you do you, you will be involved in that fault of the person and then that fault of the person of drinking and coming to work might lead you into an unsafe act, okay? Because your your body, first of all, is not functioning well because of that uh, drunkenness. You have you have taken alcohol, you've come to work, you're still not sober. Your mental functioning is not uh, at the best as required, you know. So if you are not mentally functioning well, you'll end up making these unsafe acts. For example, if you are going to work on a patient and you're shaking because of that alcohol that is still in your system, you're shaking, but you have to use the needle, okay? So you might end up getting involved in the accident, and this accident will lead to the injury. So this is what uh, Henrik was trying to explain in this domino theory, that the accident is not a standalone uh, factor, but is caused by other factors that are linked to each other, and in the end, you end up with that accident causing an injury. Then the theory of multiple causation is an extension of that domino theory, and it also recognizes that recognizes that a combination of factors leads to accidents. That accidents are not caused by only one factor. You can have interaction of human factors like unsafe act, error, lack of knowledge, maybe due to uh, lacking experience or the necessary training, and these human factors can can interact with other contributing factors, especially like in the environment, and they create an opportunity for an accident. Because if you are if you are drunk, you've come to work, you know, you are lacking the necessary experience, and you are also working on using a, a machine that is also faulty. So all these factors, if they combine and interact with each other, there is a greater opportunity for an accident to occur. And this was captured in this uh, theory of multiple causation. Then we have another theory that is called the accident triangle or pyramid. And it was also put across by Henrik, the one that gave us the domino theory. And it shows the relationship between serious accidents, minor accidents, and near misses. So the whole concept of this accident uh, triangle is to show you that at the base, you have a lot of cases of those minor acts or the minor injuries. But at the top, you have fatalities or deaths that can arise from uh, these accidents, okay? So... What Henrik and the colleagues were trying to tell us is that once you reduce the minor accidents at the base, then you will have fewer serious accidents. So you have to focus on eliminating even those minor accidents in that workplace, okay? So this Henrik triangle is trying to tell us that as we look at mitigating or preventing accidents in workplaces, and in this case, since we are looking at the healthcare facilities, we do not need to take minor accidents for granted because preventing minor accidents or paying attention to them, giving them the attention that they deserve, will end up helping us to lessen or reduce the chance of those serious accidents occurring. And these serious accidents always lead to those serious effects like death. Then the other theory is the biased liability theory, which uh, basically tells us that once someone is involved in an accident, then the chance of them getting involved in future accidents increases or decreases. Okay? 
So this is what the biased liability theory is telling us. Then from uh, the risks of possession, we look at how we can assess these risks. Okay, so we, we've uh, just looked at uh, the theories of causation of accidents and then now we want to focus on how we can assess risks that can lead to accidents in the healthcare system. So we have different approaches of assessing these risks. We have system-based approach, we have hazard-based approach, we have task-based approach. So as the name of each of these methodologies, I guess, you can look at system-based approach as that approach that focuses on the system itself. You want to look at the different parts of the system of the healthcare, you know? Is it the financing uh, uh, a part of this, of this uh, system that we are talking about? Is it, is it the administrative uh, part of this system that we are talking about? If in administration of this healthcare facility, you do not have good managers that can really look into these uh, risks and put in place mitigation measures, then you're, all, you're more likely to end up getting these accidents. If the finance uh, bit of it is not providing uh, the necessary funds to mitigate these uh, uh, risks or to prevent these accidents, then you're going to end up being at uh, a more likelihood of facing these challenges of accidents. Then hazard-based approach looks at the hazard itself. We look at, we profile hazards, you know, we look at those hazards that are more likely to occur, those hazards that are that are going to cause a lot of damage. And when we profile them, we, we make sure that we give priority to those that can cause a lot of harm, those that are more likely to happen and... Uh, we make sure that we put in place corrective measures. Then when we talk about task-based approach, we are looking at the different tasks in that healthcare system. You know, if we are looking at uh, a cleaner, uh, that task of cleaning in the healthcare facility, what are the risks that can be associated with that task? A nurse, what are the risks that are... That, that are that are associated with that nursing task. The doctor, you know, we look at all of these tasks and we look at the risks that are associated with them, but we do not just look at them, but we also make sure that we analyze the way of uh, putting in place corrective measures to lessen those risks. So this is what we are calling the risk assessment in terms of... Uh, of uh, accidents in the workplace. Then after risk assessment, we need to investigate and report these accidents. So accidents, like we said, are unplanned and undesirable occurrences, and it is always a legal requirement for us to conduct investigation whenever an accident occurs and report what we have found out from this investigation. But all this is done to make sure that we prevent future occurrence of these accidents. And uh, to add on, apart from uh, preventing future accidents, we need to discover the root cause of these, uh, of these accidents so that we put in place corrective action. Because you might think that, uh, that a person co uh, that, that, that uh, may be injected a patient with a wrong drug is maybe just drunk, okay? Or the, it was just because of shaking or miscommunication and you, you, you think that that was just the cause. But it could be some other root cause apart from that. It could be because of poor supervision and this poor supervision could be due to underfunding. The supervisors think that they are not receiving... Uh, be, feel that they are not receiving enough motivation or incentive to do this supervision, so they do not supervise at all. If they do not supervise, these people end up, or these junior staff end up making these mistakes. So you have to make sure that you investigate thoroughly, you conduct that root cause analysis that we are going to see 
so that you make sure that when you put in place a corrective action, it is going to to focus on 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 solving that root cause itself. If it is underfunding, if you solve that underfunding, it means that it will have solved all these all these uh, uh, effects that led to this accident. Okay, yeah. So another purpose is to majorly focus on fact finding, fact uh, find the facts that that are associated with this accident and do not focus on blaming the person who was involved in this accident. So uh, preparing uh, an accident investigation report needs us to respond immediately whenever an accident occurs. We gather our facts by use of even eyewitnesses sometimes and uh, whenever you are gathering these facts, you, you can always take photographs so that they save you that uh, uh, that time of, of, of words or using words. Because photographs always tell a bigger story than the words themselves. Then analyze the data very well so as to make uh, a better meaning and uh, develop a corrective action plan so as to mitigate future accidents. So Whenever you're preparing this investigation plan, you need to respond immediately, gather facts by using uh, photographs and eyewitnesses, analyze the data, and put in place a corrective action plan. So the importance of doing this reporting is that it will enable us to, to, to unearth the causes so that we can prevent the future occurrence of these, of these incidents. Then it will also ensure prompt medical treatment because uh, uh, because people will have the facts that lead to this, uh, uh, these incidents and accidents. Then it enhances uh, workplace safety because it facilitates corrective action plans which will, which will enable us to put in place mitigation measures that can enhance this uh, workplace safety. So the types of accidents that we need to always report uh, include fatalities or those accidents that are potentially, uh, that can potentially lead to death. Then we have injuries from work-related accidents and then certain gas incidents that can always lead to future uh, disability or it can always lead to uh, a lot of a lot of effects in the in the general population so these accidents need to be reported and they need to be reported as soon as possible so the time the time frames that need to be observed when we are reporting accidents and incidents in the workplace, uh, especially now that we are talking about the healthcare workplace, we need to make sure that we report within 10 days of an incident. And if that is not possible, you can go uh, for 15 days, especially for those injuries that are related to that workplace. And then diseases that arise from the workplace need to be reported as soon as they are discovered. Then the other phenomenon that we need to look at in this session is accident analysis and prevention. And this analysis and prevention, uh, first, let's focus on this accident analysis, is all to aim at preventing future accidents. And it is an in-depth study of the incidents and their causes. And like we said, it focuses on finding the root causes. Like I said, you need not to stop on the surface of an accident, okay? A health worker injecting a patient with, uh, with, with, uh, with the wrong drug should not let you think that that is all, you know? Maybe this person was not thinking straight. What could have caused that not thinking straight? Is it because they, they were drunk? Is it because they were on pressure? And if they were drunk, why are they involved in drinking, you know? Is it because 
there, there, there is a lot of stress with work. They are, they are overloaded with work. And maybe now this stress has caused them to resort to drinking. So you need to focus on finding those root causes because it is only when you discover the root causes that you're able to put in place a sustainable solution to these accidents. So this accident analysis will enable us to focus on finding those root causes to prevent similar accidents in the future and emphasize corrective actions and not blaming just blaming individuals here and there. So the categories of this accident analysis can include causal analysis, what we call the root cause analysis or RCA. We can have expert analysis where we can use experts and then organization analysis where we analyze uh, all the entire system of that workplace, you know. So when we look at the root cause analysis, we are talking about the systematic process of identifying the underlying cause of an accident and finding the appropriate situation. So it aims to prevent the reoccurrence, like I said, of those accidents rather than just treating the symptoms. Like I've been saying, you do not want to stop at the surface whenever you are trying to, to analyze what could have led to this accident, okay? So different tools have been designed to help us in this root cause analysis or to really unearth those causes of the accidents and they include the fishbone diagram or the Ishikawa diagram. We have the failure mode and effect analysis. We also have the fault tree analysis. And the Ishikawa <coughs> diagram or the fishbone diagram you can imagine how a fish bone can be it is that one long bone connected with other bones so it is trying this diagram is trying to tell us that problems can be broken down into subcategories you know and this will enable us to figure out the possible causes and solutions to the problem being investigated like a problem is not just a standalone thing. It is having subcategories and it is only when you discover what led to that problem and what led to even those subcategories that you can put in place solutions to this problem that is being investigated. Then we look, when we look at the failure mode and effect analysis, we are able to analyze the different ways how systems can fail. And if they fail, what is the consequence of such failures? That is what we are calling the failure mode and effect analysis. Okay, so when we look at the healthcare system, we can look at the different parts of the healthcare system that can fail. Is it the, is it the financing uh, part? Is it the administrative part? Is it the lab part? Is it the, the OPD? You know, so you have to look at all those different systems, analyze ways in which they can fail. So this is more of a proactive kind of analysis, you know. It happens even before the, the accident takes place. So you do it before uh, to mitigate or to, to make sure that uh, this accident does not take place. But it can also help you even when it has taken place, to really uh, unearth what could have led to this accident. You look at those different systems and you analyze deeply on how they can fail and then the consequences of such failures. Then the fault tree analysis explores the causes of system level failures and uh, that lead to these accidents and it prioritizes those risks allowing the highest risks to be resolved fast. So in the fault tree, we are looking at prioritizing these risks and giving uh, most attention to those highest risks so that we can be, they can be resolved fast. So that is what we call the root cause analysis that aims at unearthing the real cause or the deepest cause or, the, or that 
definitive cause that could have co- uh, could have led to this accident. And once we unearth that, we are able to uh, prevent reoccurrence of these accidents. Then, after investigation, after analyzing uh, the causes of these accidents, we need to record and report these accidents and near misses. When we talk about near misses, we are looking at uh, those uh, incidents uh, that could have potentially caused harm, but they, they did not happen or we narrowly missed them. Okay. Yeah, so that's what we call the near misses. So in recording these accidents and near misses, we need to be as simple as possible and very clear so that our message is understood. We need to effectively communicate. We need to review injuries and locations and we need to focus on prevention. Then uh, after we've uh, recorded and analyzed all this, we can look at accident mitigation strategies. So now that we have seen how to analyze uh, risks of these accidents, how to analyze the accidents themselves, the causes of these uh, accidents, then how can we prevent these accidents from occurring? Okay, How can we put in place measures that can uh, prevent these undesirable and unplanned occurrences. So to prevent these accidents, we need to implement uh, the following strategies, and one of them is training and education. We need to ensure that the staff or the healthcare facility staff receive thorough training on safety protocols and best practices. Healthcare facility uh, workers need to be sh- to, to, to know that Whenever they are working on patients, they need to put on uh, gloves and put them on very well. You know, they need to to be protected and protect the patient from from uh, anything that can lead to to transfer of infection. And this needs to be on uh, a continual kind of 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 of, of, uh, of fashion. You know. We need to offer these regular updates on these uh, protocols and best practices. So you do not just train once and and you give it off, but you need to continually update these uh, best practices and protocols. Continually engage these staff in uh, in 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 uh, this training. You know, it can be after two months. It can be after a month. We conduct this training to to see and to get feedback from this staff. Maybe the, the the one that you had taught them is not working in your setting. Now you need to update. You need not to be rigid but flexible, so that we can prevent or mitigate uh, accidents from occurring. Then the other thing that we can do, or we can put in place to mitigate these accidents, is. Uh, supervision and oversight. And here we need to do adequate supervision, especially for those, for the staff that is less experienced, uh, ensure mechanisms for reporting safety concerns to higher authorities so that we can always respond promptly to these uh, occurrences of accidents. Then the other strategy is to communicate better or to improve communication. We need to encourage open and clear communication among healthcare team members. Someone should not be in fear when they report an accident incident, you know, or when they report faulty uh, equipment that could potentially lead to an accident. So if someone maybe uh, engages in in, in making an equipment faulty, they shouldn't fear that they will be punished and they and, and they end up not reporting some of these uh, of these incidents which could lead to accidents. So there should be that open and clear communication among healthcare teams. But also 
uh, we can take on what we call the SBA or the situation background assess background assessment recommendation technique to 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 do effective handoffs and and when we are talking about these handoffs we, we are looking at uh, for example referrals or or handing over a patient to another uh, health professional so if a patient is moving from one facility to another or from one ward to another or from one health professional maybe of the of the morning shift and going to the one of of the evening shift then there should be this technique of communicating that can prevent these accidents from occurring and here you want to look at the situation whereby you communicate to the other health profession about the situation at hand first of all you talk about you yourself your name and uh, your uh, your qualification the situation at hand of the patient how they are and then the background what have you done how were they feeling before and then the assessment you look at the vital signs you know the bp the blood pressure the pulse you know how have you assessed and then the recommendation what you think should be done so if this communication technique is uh, is 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 put in place it will help in building that common language for communicating critical events and it will lessen those communication barriers between different healthcare workers so if you communicate well for example when you are referring a patient then the other person who is receiving or the other healthcare professional who is receiving this patient they know clearly where they can start from then we need to put in place and promote a culture of safety whereby reporting incidents and near misses is encouraged without fear of reprisal or or fear of uh, being punished you know so encourage but uh, participation by staff in safety improvement initiatives so that uh, they own and they feel responsible for these safety measures. Then we need to leverage on on, on uh, technology, utilize health records and barcoding systems to minimize medication errors and uh, employ patient monitoring devices to enhance patient safety. So all this is majorly to make sure that uh, we use technology which if used well, will 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 uh, lessen the occurrence of those human errors, you know. So if you use the technology very well, then you're able to minimize some of these errors that can result from medication errors, or some of these errors that can uh, can be uh, that can be potentially leading to accidents. So if you put in place or we implement these technology strategies, then we are able to prevent uh, these accidents from occurring. Then, last but not least, is to conduct a root cause analysis. Like we said, this root cause analysis will be able to unearth that real or definitive cause of this accident without just superficially uh, looking at this accident we are able to dig deeper and discover what could have led to this accident. And when we conduct this root cause analysis, especially for those severe accidents, we are able to, under, to identify the underlying issues and implement effective solutions, all those solutions that will last that test of time, that, that will be sustainable because they are, they are focusing on that root cause or that definitive cause of this accident so when we put in place these prevention strategies then we can be able to prevent or mitigate these accidents so we think of uh, <coughs> things like training and and uh, continually updating this training supervision and oversight improving our communication uh, promoting a safety culture, leveraging on technology, and conducting root cause analysis. So 
in conclusion we need to realize that uh, accidents uh, whereas they are unplanned and uh, undesirable and unfortunate they have various causes yes and uh, sometimes they can be environmental sometimes they can be organizational or at system level but other times they can be at human level but these these uh, causes when analyzed very well when uh, critically looked at can enable us to develop these preventive strategies that will help us in mitigating these accidents from occurring in our workplaces we have used the healthcare workplace as an example but that does not mean these strategies cannot be employed in other workplaces so as public health professionals we are implored to make sure that we tailor these strategies to make sure that they work in other workplaces thank you so much for your time and have a good day